Welcome Hold to good. Welcome to um, another episode of the Austin Software Cooperative Meetup. This is our first meetup for 2019. <clears throat> um, we've been doing this for quite a few years now. If you like to check out other videos, um, go to the meetup or our Google Hangouts account. So today's topic is on organic. Agile development for software cooperatives. There's a four minute video you can check out. There's a link there. We'll go through the um, looking at that, the sketch notes, and then have a little discussion on this. Um, I will, I think I could turn it over right here to you, Watson, if you'd like. Uh, um, I don't know if you want to look at the video or jump right into the sketch notes, how you want to do this. I'll just uh, jump into the sketch notes and kind of want to do this more in a, a conversational tone uh, this time through. Uh, through. Sounds uh, great. All right. <clears throat> Stop sharing and you can share yours. I'm, I'm already sharing. Great. Okay. All right. So uh, this is a sketch note. This is the first time we've we've kind of done it this way. Um, I'd like to try to get some feedback on each one of these these points here. Um, but a general overview um, when we say organic um, agile development, the organic portion, uh, there's some unique um, needs um, for for a like a democratic organization or a flat organization um, where you're trying to you, you, everyone has some type of ownership or some type of ability to I guess vote or something like that so you need to figure out a way to play nice and get buy-in and um, try to bring people along instead of uh, the command and control style. So it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of, uh, you know, a top town type um, system. So within uh, Agile, it, it seems to lend itself well, but there's some things that I, I think need to be made explicit within Agile in order to make it more organic. Um, and, and another thing, I think the way that we work as a cooperative are kind of sometimes a little bit ephemeral. So um, some people may join and some people may leave, like a, maybe a contractor or someone that has a unique skill. And so as an individual, um, oftentimes, you may have done some work and oftentimes, like even before you even think about being a cooperative or anything like that, you think, oh, I want to work with some friends, you know, and we're all smart. Let's all get together and get something done. And you may have tried, tried that and maybe um, had some issues. Uh, just coming together and deciding to work on something doesn't always, it doesn't always work. It's not always efficient. Um, so you're kind of thrust into that 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 place where you may wish that you you know back for the days of command and control. You know things are inefficient, people aren't delivering, and that kind of thing. So how is it that you can bring people together in such a way to where a team can can uh, kind of be democratic, um, self organizing, but also be efficient. So part of that is educating everyone on the types of pitfalls that you'll run into if you don't um, behave or um, obey some of the rules of Agile or whatever system. Agile is the, the system that we use. And uh, I tried to capture that in this in the three or four minute video for people that want to come on board. So any questions so far about this? Has everyone watched the video? Okay. Um, just comments, not even questions, but just like things that, you know, off, off the top of your head when you're 
watching it, it was like, this is wrong or this is different or something, or this is boring, you know, anything. No one wants to step up. Huh? I like the video. <laughs> <laughs> Um, kind of fits in, I, I think, with a lot of it being tied into stuff that we already want to do or we're already doing makes it um, makes it uh, easier. Some of our topics are a little bit more against um, the norm. Do you have a version of this, the sketch notes, where it can focus in on the but the points like the video does where it could go, here's the brainstorming. Or do we just kind of use the image that you're showing? Yeah, I don't have a drill down into each one. Um, but I was going to talk about just the brainstorming here in a second because it's something that um, I think for us it was kind of important. So if no one has any other comments, I was going to go into that. Um, there's some comments in the group chat. Mm, okay. Okay, there we go. So the question or comment, it seemed like standard development practices for enterprise software, what was supposed to be different in regards to democratic principles. So <clears throat> on the implementation portion where you see this pull system, I personally, I mean, I've been developing software for 30 years and I've never been in an enterprise situation where people just pull on work that they feel like doing. So um, that after you, and we'll get to that and we'll go down each one of these, but by the time you get to the implementation portion, and the, and everything has already been prioritized and everything like that. At that point, then you can, say, okay, if there's 10 tickets, I'm going to pick ticket number three and I'm going to work on it, check it out, that kind of thing. Um, this also works well with like an open source type environment. But uh, I'm, I'm sure some people do that in enterprise, but enterprises, enterprises, I mean, there's very few enterprises that are not command and control. Uh, the, there's assignments, it kind of, I mean, the most flat, situation that I've seen would be you'd have someone that's like a project manager that says, okay, what do we want to work on? We've got five tasks and um, people in the meeting will say, I work on this, I'll work on this, but a pull system is kind of even more um, asynchronous than that. Uh, so there's that. And um, I think a thing that we, concentrate on also or we've been trying to concentrate on is the cross training portion where there will be a lot of um, traditionally people on the call where we're doing preparation and it, maybe I should wait on that but um, that are getting cross trained on things that maybe that's not their specialization so um, so uh, <clears throat> so we have that um, there's some other things if you have more, if you're also, you know, really interested, we have a lot of papers on the organic, uh, concept. Um, one of the things is like organic resources and how they get distributed. So if you create something in a democratic organization, you know, how is it that it, can that thing be redistributed from you? Do you own it? That kind of thing what all comes from that, what type of problems arise from that. And enterprise is just like, you know, you don't own, you don't really own or have any power over anything you create. Uh, so there's lots of things that can come into play there, but I don't talk too much about that here. Is it, uh, anything else? It's, I think we'll get, we can dig more into that question as we go. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> talk more about the brainstorming uh, portion. Um, I kind of, I spent, I don't know, 
it seemed like two hours trying to find these quotes because I have literally, let's say five, four or five books on creativity. And I know I read, I don't know, it was like 10 years ago. <laughs> um, the stuff that I have in this, this uh, quote here. And I could not find it, but I knew it was buried somewhere in one of my books. But these are all some some good books on um, that have a section on brainstorming, but creativity. So myths of innovation, the Medici effect is the one that the, that I grabbed it from. Creativity, um, Tinker Toys, and Cracking Creativity. I have a bunch of exercises for doing um, uh, brainstorming. So you're trying to get you're trying to get a group to be involved, and so there's some counterintuitive truths about trying to get a group to be creative and do some problem solving um, that I wanted to highlight here. So the guy that kind of coined the phrase, Alex Osborne uh, uh, for um, brainstorming. And it was all the rage. It's kind of just like a thing that you would, it's just part of your lexicon now. You don't even know that it was created at some point or coined. Uh, so, Here's some, here are the principles for it. Produce as many ideas as possible. Produce ideas as wild as possible. Build upon each other's ideas. Avoid passing judgment on ideas. So um, there's a bunch of stuff here, but you may have think, you may have kind of have an intuition or you may have read some things about say things like groupthink and um, other things that might stop you from not from wanting to be in a brainstorming session. And um, I'm just going to read some of this so that we know that there's some facts to back that up. Uh, let's see here. Um, you know, so I'm just going to say that there's a, a difference between, well, let me just read this. The first study to test Osborne claim came in 1958, uh, 1958, only one year after his book has been published. Psychologists led a groups of four people uh, brainstorming practical benefits of difficulties that would arrive if someone had an extra thumb, okay, on the, on each hand. So you've got real groups and virtual groups. The real groups were doing real brainstorming. The virtual groups were off on their own individually generating the idea, uh, ideas, and then they came back, okay? So this is people trying to test whether brainstorming works after Osborne did all of his influential book and coined the phrase and all that. So counterintuitively, to their surprise, the researchers found that the virtual groups where they brainstormed individually, it generally uh, generated nearly twice as many ideas as the real groups, right? And it's not an anomaly. And it was um, in 1987, uh, uh, Michael Diego and Wolfgang Strobe uh, concluded that brainstorming groups have never outperformed virtual groups. Of the 25 reported experiments, real groups have never once been shown to be more productive than virtual groups. Right? So real groups that engage in brainstorming consistently generate about half the number of ideas they would have produced if the group's individuals had pondered the problem on their own. So it looks dismal. Um, so these researchers set out to understand why brainstorming was such an unpredictable methodology. Uh, and then I'll just stop here, uh, for a second. These, um, this book, the Medici effect has really good examples of people going, being studied while they were brainstorming. Um, of, of all these books that I'm recommending, this one was the best well this was the um the best written book and most ac accessible um and you can see certain issues problems being solved with groups and and applying the stuff that i'm that i grabbed in this quote um so uh there were some issues people might think that free riders like some people just want to just relax and rely on others. It was that the issue is that why brainstorming didn't work. And it's not really the big deal where people, this one evaluation apprehension. So are you think that because you're going to be critiqued, was that the problem? And it wasn't really it. It was a phenomenon called blocking that was responsible for the vast difference between brainstorming in a group and doing so individually. 
So I'm going to read this whole thing. In the brainstorming group, only one person can speak at a time, although not necessarily in any particular order. If everyone spoke at once, no one would hear what the other said. But this presents a big problem for us humans. Our short-term memory is not capable of developing new ideas and at the same time keeping the old ones in active storage. If we become blocked in our reporting our ideas beca uh, because we have to wait for someone else to describe theirs, we may forget them altogether. This makes a big difference in our output. Since we cannot simply call out an idea when we think of it, we have to wait until the current speaker has finished. So this portion, they have examples of this happening and talking about it, um, drilling in on it. So essentially, when you get interrupted, that kills your creativity. So the whole thing, the idea of brainstorming, and then also with these 25 tests that they set up here, where they didn't obey the rules, with main rule being this rule right here, avoid passing judgment on ideas, they were able to get interrupted. So yeah, brainstorming isn't a bunch of people getting together and yelling. It's you can't interrupt each other otherwise or, or critique or anything. Otherwise, it's better for you to just be individually, uh, individually coming up with ideas. And you kind of if you're a developer, you kind of know this. If you sit in a room with a bunch of people working on an actually hard problem, a really hard problem, you're worse. If you're off on your own on a problem that when I say hard, it's something that takes weeks to solve in the end, then you, you probably can go on, you come up with ideas on your own. Now, fluctuating back and forth with people, that's the idea of the virtual group that we said earlier. So that would fall in, not in the brainstorming group. Now, um, in order to get around that, Diego and Strobe, uh, they suggest another way to sidestep the problem with traditional brainstorming is a technique called brain writing. While brain writing, people simultaneously generate written ideas on the same problem, building off each other's ideas without speaking at all. Here's how you do it. Everyone sits at a table, each person with a blank sheet with paper, another blank sheet is in the middle of the table within everyone's reach. The basic problem to be solved or um, exploited has been clear. I think I wrote this in wrong, it's not exploited. Has been clearly described or written down. At the start of the session, each person writes or sketches one idea on the sheet in front, to that, uh, in front of them and tosses the sheet into the center of the table and everyone um, picks up the sheet. Basically, you you continuously um, build on whatever it is that's thrown into the middle of the table. If you can't build on it, then you write something new. And you do that for a while. Could be 15 minutes. They put 30 minutes on the on the um, in the book. And then with the tests, people are able to um, create much more ideas and then afterwards then you cut things down so is anybody oh, okay and some other books like i said these other books they say the medici effect all these other books they say the same thing they quote the same different the same studies and they expound on it so if you're interested in brainstorming or creativity in general um these books are good so anyone have any comments so far Did everybody just know this stuff already? Uh, my question is more so, where have you specifically used this? Or is this something you're presenting to the group? Uh, we've, we've, we've done this. I, I know that they didn't know that I got this from this book, but I, mm -hmm. we've def specifically done that thing that I just described with the papers and with mind maps and stuff like that. But we go back and forth um with and then what i'm probably going to get into is with this portion here with the brainstorming when you don't do that portion every every step in here and then i probably want to get some comments from people but every step in here if you don't do the first step it rears its head in the next step that's that's my position that's what i think happens and then at what point do you circle back to kind of you know, agile be more iterative 
what triggers a searching back to a brainstorming session? Oh, I, so I think, cause I haven't seen the brainstorming so much explicitly said in like agile books, I've seen the retrospective and other things kind of, and then requirements, gathering meetings and stuff like that. But explicitly saying, here's a problem solving portion. I haven't seen that so much, but the thing about agile that is great is that you get to try again every sprint or every you know couple sprints or something like that. I'm saying that with the brainstorming, if you weren't able to get, if you failed essentially on a sprint and you need to get back uh, set again, then you should start out with a brainstorming for the thing that you failed on where you need creativity. If you don't need to be innovative, you don't need to be creative, then you don't really need it so much. Right. And when you have um, a process like design thinking, for example, that might be a way to marry this approach um, with an agile development process more so that you are able to incorporate a more iterative, you know, fail quickly kind of um, strategy within the confines of, of a sprint or, or a um, short term release. This is true. We, we really need to get more uh, familiar with the design thinking um, proud. Um, are, yeah, I'm assuming you guys are with them. <laughs> Or no? Um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wheelhouse. <laughs> okay, cool. That's awesome. That's good. We it's interesting. We could have a whole long discussion about design um, versus agile. In, in my opinion, a lot of the agile material is hostile towards yes the design. So yes, very much so. It, it, Taylor can talk more about this. So we we've, we've because we're we're you know, we're developers, you know, program, and we're we've we said okay, we've worked on so many projects where the design wasn't there, and it's essentially doesn't work because the design wasn't there, the user experience wasn't there, whatever. And it's like you at some point you we have this saying like we're we're kind of tired of just taking people's money. It's like you know it's a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so they we really wanted to, to push design hard and we've done it in so many different ways we've partnered with design companies that are like very 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 expensive and we said okay we're gonna get we have you know friends that are designers um happens that none are on this call but um and in, in the group in the cooperative in you know my thing is like it became uh it it got to the point to where we're familiar with the the parts where there's like a, it's like a strange bedfellows almost with designers where designers hate anything by committee. And so I'm very hey, anything what? By, by committee. And by anything committee. by committee. Yeah. I, I really, you know, any, you know, anytime I find someone that is a manager of designers, I just want to pick their brain. So it's like, <laughs> how did you make that work? Right. Um, but yeah. Um, but I, we did find it's like anything where you have designers on a small team. If you have a designer and you have implementers all together under one house, you're working magic. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Any anyone else? You guys are quiet today. I like the idea of circling back and I guess on the thinking that the organic is picking this stuff as needed and if if we I guess thinking um, if you're in an environment where things are changing all the time then being able to say you went from one area where you were moving forward and knowing well we need to step all the way back or whatever um, but using them as you not saying you must always go all the way through and not stop and say that you may need to go back. Um, we've had, it's, it seems to be a better fit for the open source staff and 
projects that are active like that. And then where it's been harder is when working with enterprise older, um, like old systems where they're trying to, we've done a lot of moder modernization trying to help them. And there's, it's such a struggle to um, get any of the concepts. And sometimes we've ended up selling one part of this, if we say all of these different pieces, and they're really behind it, but they don't want to do something, including like much of the, the front end um, design side user research and everything else, like a big fight on that, um, on that side, and then jump right in. But yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, we worked with, uh, we have good friends with a design company, user experience company, I should say, user researchers, PhDs in psychology, you know, that group. Um, and it's uh, interesting where they'll say, everybody thinks that they're Steve Jobs. Everybody thinks that they, they know the right way for their customers. Um, and they don't need to do research, user research. So that's one extreme all the way to that side. And then they deal with that side. The other side is the literal artsy fartsy designer that is essentially a mini Steve Jobs that is like, do you think you want to get the battery out of your phone? And he says, nope, you don't. And I'm not letting you have that. And then you say later, oh, I, I guess I didn't want to get the battery on my phone. I like that. Um, all th those extremes on each side, trying to wrestle with that, and then you're not in that space, you're an implementer, is just perilous. Um, I'm in interested to hear what you guys have to say about that in the 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 um service design. I think they're debating. They turn down the sound. <laughs> um, so I, I'd i like to, I mean, whatever it is that people are interested in, uh, I'd like to talk about those things. Everybody's watched the video already. So um, is there anything else? Any further comments? Well, I just wanted to, I mean, y'all you're, you're, were touching a little bit, but um, uh, you know, I'm new to the co-op thing, so if if you're asking questions, yeah. Um, uh, in your experience, like, what size team are you talking about here, uh, working on this, and what size, whatever definition you want to for it, what size project are you are you are you all typically working with when you're trying to implement these things? Hmm. Who wants to answer that? Um, so I think one of the comments Watson had is for us, we're a group of people that have a lot of different experience. Um, Watson's done a whole lot in large enterprise and dealing with software that's, you wouldn't, it's, it's very functional and not very pretty. And I've kind of been all over, um, as a group though, since we've come together, um, We've done a lot of work with taking, I would say, mid-size businesses. Um, as far as I'm thinking like capital and revenue and stuff. So they're anywhere from a hundred to a couple of hundred employees type things. And um, a lot of stakeholders and working with the old software and everything so we end up one of the we've worked with companies like in insurance um, across the board where you have they have a lot of little sub companies and then the types where it's kind of that large long-running company that's been built up kind of as maybe family owned at the start now it's it's not but it still has that kind of feel um, and we've done we've worked with a lot of startups that are very very early age like when they're here's our idea and app um, and that'll end up often being someone was 
in marketing and has design. They were doing some some design experience and a few other people, and you have um, those type of groups. So you could talk with maybe you you may end up in a room with someone who's thinking of investing, and they're also semi a customer. Um, and then uh, the open source side. On the open source, we're dealing with groups of anywhere from five to 10 people, or it could be four to five different groups of 10 to 20. You know, it's um, some of the projects we've been working on lately of we're having to do integration with groups where they have completely different goals and trying to figure out where the complements are where we're trying to solve something and we'd like to help them and seeing how they could help us and make make all of that work that really makes it difficult with like prioritization and and trying to get people to like how much can they actually commit versus um, yes I'll help but whenever you have your own internal deadlines come up you drop your usually going to drop something external so how to lock in something and th those have been interesting especially when it your your customer has no control because you're actually dealing with multiple groups so you you're trying to get participation and commitment and getting people to like if you're doing the brainstorming actually get people to participate then versus two months later and bringing something up that might have been critical but getting people to do that when it's completely voluntary is a totally different story, um, which that ties in, I guess, with the cooperative side where if we have a lot of, a lot of it where it may be voluntary and deciding on what you're going to work on to try to lower the barrier of I guess communication and figure out how that can work better. So anyways, that was a little bit about the projects, I guess, and people along with the, the work. So it seems like the, if you're talking about the brainstorming versus prioritization, of course, you know, in the agile world, that's the, the product owner and them getting funding and then uh, coming over to uh, the team with a, a backlog. and um, and stacking up like the product owner owning the backlog is kind of a normal agile or really scrum uh, mindset of things. And um, it seems like if you're talking about brainstorming and you're talking about prioritization and how to do that democratically, you're also talking about funding and money. Uh, that's and a good, good um, question. For me, when I was putting this together and then also another person that I think is good about talking about agile um, when it comes to the procurement process is Alistair Coburn. Um, basically, when it's time for doing sales and it's time to ask for money and all that, it's all bets are off in my, my opinion. It's whatever, would, however you put the proposal together, however you get them to, you know, open up the pocketbook, it's however you did it. And show, if you are a rock star, right, if you're IDEO or however, whoever you are, if you're already producing, that's your signal. It doesn't matter. It's like, hey, we succeed. You fail. You should pay us to fix your problems. Don't worry about how we do our process. You can come in and sit with us if you want, but you know, this is how we do it. You don't like it, go get someone else. So is this prioritization and brainstorming already within a defined project that y'all are, are, are commissioned for? And this is how your, it's more your internal process of how y'all go about solving that? If you, if you are already, the, imagine the customer's already sold on, like they just said, yep, we're doing whatever you want. Let's go ahead and do that. And then this is operating in that like clean space. This does not um, show you how to do procurement, asking for money, all that stuff. 
that stuff would be like, I think that that is best handled in a totally different way of, um, it, it has to do my, my issue with it is it has to do with signal. It has to do with how much they trust you, like you want to work with you, you know, how much of a rock star you are or whatever. If you're Jack Welsh and you're the best CEO in the history of mankind, it doesn't matter how, what your process, they're just going to give you money. Right. So, um, and if no one knows you and you say, this is how our process works, they're like, whatever, it, it, no, prove to us. And they're going to, you're going to get in a situation where they're, Hey, um, can you do some free work for us? Show us, show us what, what you can do. Oh, that looks good. Can you do some more free work for us? Show us what you can do. And you're just going to be in the abyss. So th there's, that is a different issue in my opinion. Um, having dealt with, and we have a paper on that too, by the way. <laughs> if you like. anyone else i mean what that's my opinion so, so i'd like to hear someone else's i mean i've kind of lived through that with you here so i i have i agree with that um it's you can have a really great process or great software or anything else. And if they don't know you or you don't know how to sell it, then it doesn't matter. Um, and so you need those, those skills are separate. There can be overlap, of course, but they're different skills. Did we understand the, the question or your, do you have, what are your thoughts on that? I was just trying to understand more in context of is this in the side of the internal process of um, the project? You already have the high level uh, goals and of what y'all are trying to achieve, and you know, kind of a target of when you know, eventually you know trying to deliver to the customer. And this is the um, the flow that y'all have of in, inside of that, and you know, whether it's uh, two weeks or three weeks or one week, whatever it is. Of uh, the agile um, cycles, um, uh, y'all just breaking down where you're in there. I didn't know if it was that or if you were actually in the talking to the stakeholders and uh, and bringing them all the way back in, and you were doing more of an ongoing uh, customer engagements and along those lines. Yeah, let's let's give two different scenarios. Uh, one customer. Is it's a situation where they think that they know exactly what they want. And you're in a consulting position where it's like, okay, they know 70% of what they want. Um, 30% of what they, they, of it is they actually don't know what they want. They think they do, but they don't. And I gotta, we gotta convince them different. And so you're in a true consulting position there. Um, then the other, other side would be um situation for probably for the last two years on that we've been in where they didn't know they didn't know anything they didn't know what they wanted they wanted in the end they wanted a dashboard but they didn't know and there was a lot of brainstorming committees um kind people kind of asking for free work that kind of thing and you're you're in a brainstorming situation and you know, they're saying, I want the, everything, you know, under, under the moon. So, um, it can be your, your, the sales part and the requirements gathering part and the consulting part and all that stuff. Um, they have to be handled. Um, and agile doesn't, as far as I can tell, it doesn't handle consulting that part. You gotta go to elsewhere to get to, to get those things i mean you could do it intuitively um like i said signal can handle some things but um i i don't think you can get away from these steps here what is signal Any oh questions? when i say signal i mean it's like i'm using it in the economic uh viewpoint we use it a lot in our papers but it's it's um your how people view you um if you have a like your market like your your um, reputation could be signal 
right? You got a degree from Harvard. That's a signal. Um, did you do really good work before you put it out there? You got past performance. That's a signal. Um, those are all uh, signals. Um, but it's like I'm using an economic uh, 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 way. Um, so I, I think that that's a really good I normally don't like to just use a word and it's not, you know, it's not common, but that word I think is very useful for these discussions um, because people, um, when they want to say, well, how do I get someone to do X? You know, we're talking about issues of selling, negotiating, influence, and these things. Signal is a portion where people, they have this, they have this concept or this idea or intuition that, well, if I make a better mousetrap, especially programmers, we think that if we make a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to our door. And it's like, no, um, you can make the best mousetrap and no one cares. Um, the, the signal, the marketing, you know, everything that is around your mousetrap is a big part, maybe the most important part. Um, so agile, just because you have a good process, that's not signal. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, sorry, guys. Specific. Um, I'm also have a question here about uh, points. You said you do a one to thirteen. Yeah, the Fibonacci sequence. So, well, it goes beyond that, but I, oh, what, yeah. why do you do thirteen? It's like the. Oh, I mean, it could go further. If someone wants to be, <laughs> but the, so the issue with points, the, the 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 discussion. So. Whenever you say to some customer, someone asking you, I use the economic term is like a principal is asking the agent to do some work, right? Someone's asking you to do work and then you say, okay, this is how long it's going to take or whatever. They want to know how much they have to pay, how long it's going to take and all that. But in agile world, we want to say, um, estimates with the software. As well, right? Estimates are garbage. You know, we don't we don't really know. We're lying when we say we do know that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so we want to say points. We want to say, okay, a one is something we've done before, and all this stuff, right? And then three, you know, you go higher and higher. So, um, and it's just, based on knowledge and previous experience, as opposed to right. Right. And then mm -hmm. and the, and the concept is velocity. So whatever it is that you measure, you just measure it the same way over and over through your sprints. And then you say, OK, the, the way that we measure, we know for this team, we can do 20 points a week. And that's what we can do. So when we come through and estimate your stuff, when we come up with 25, and you've seen that we consistently only done 20, we're lying if we say we can do it, you know, in a week. And then you get something that's better than, you know, um, than the traditional, oh, this is going to take six months or whatever. That's the. How, how stable is your team? Because the, the, I asked this in the point of in my experience dealing with, with the, the point systems is that they, um, it's great until you add another person in or you take a person out. And suddenly if the, if the team changes up, then you're, your point system is just really hard to like rework. I think talking on behalf of the agile people that or scrum people, whoever it is using points, they would just say, yeah, but where you, you know, pick your poison, you're not going to get any better. There's no other system you're going to pick that's better at estimating than this way. So change the people all you want. It's you, you know, what you're going to go back to, you're going to go back to, basically a manager saying this should take six weeks and then the in, in a command control system the person saying yeah you know uh, i'll try to get it done that's what you're going to go to so the, talking on behalf of that side so i come from enterprise i come from give me hours that kind of thing and so i'm used to translating points to hours like it's going to take this long like it's something in the middle but we want to do points. Um, we, we feel like it's you're essentially lying if you don't. But you have to come up with something. This goes into the how do you tell 
a customer, like the procurement process, like they're not just going to open the pocketbook and just give you endless amounts of money. You've got to tell them something, right? So that's where the tickets portion is where you're starting to relieve some of that, um, where they're just trusting you for everything. It's kind of like, okay, no, we, here's some commitments for you. Is that kind of. So you're, you're using somebody else or somebody on your, on your team is actually talking to the customer and having to translate points and projections forward to what the business people can understand as to when they can start to see the product because points, you know, is, is uh, somewhat helpful internal to the team, but I found it'd be much more helpful outside the team because at least if we're guessing on the points, it's better than them guessing. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So you say you're saying that points is helpful outside of the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To a customer. Yeah. Well, no, no, or, no, no, well, it depends not, on who not, you want to define as a customer. I mean, not, a customer could be the client or the customer could be the manager. I mean, if you're looking at a more um, a slightly more traditional corporate structure, the client could be the, the senior VP of R&D. And they, um, and they you know, like for example. Exactly. No, they do because they're able to say, OK, no, that has no, been no, my no, experience. No, no, no. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> the, on the business side, they are typically trying to think about schedule. Exactly. They're trying to think of when can they have something. Exactly. And somebody has to translate from the development point system over to the business of saying, you have these products, we're, we're pushing them forward, these features we're building out for you. And I am looking at the past performance of the team. They've mm -hmm. given me points. And now I'm saying to you, projecting forward in somewhere between you know three months to six months whatever it is that the team has agreed to on the features levels and what their what the complexity they they foresee in this is that you know in five months or so we're going to be delivering some awesome stuff to you but don't plan on it earlier than that right like so for example they could say in a previous we have a history that in this kind of a release like a point release that, that has three um, minor features to have, you know, this kind of scope to them in terms of the level, the complexity of the functionality, mm -hmm. let's say it's a hundred points and you know, okay, every time we've, we've delivered this kind of release has been within like 85 to 125 points. So the team comes back and says, yeah, we're thinking it's like one five, then the project manager or the senior VP is going to look at that and say, okay, so last time we were able to do that, and I don't know, let's say I was going to magically come up with a number, say three months. Last time we were able to do that in three months. So, hey, we probably should be able to do that in three months again. And so then they're able to start building out a roadmap. So, but the point system allows for the, the team to come back and say, uh, exactly. there's extra complexity exactly. that's going on. Um, and that, but it also does allow inside the team the point system can be nice because then it's like there's been some initial um, uh, judgment or some initial guesswork on on these things. And as you're pulling them off, you're like, well, is this a, a three point thing or is this a five point thing? I'm trying, about to bite off here. Exactly. So inside the team, it's used one way outside the team. It, again, it's all guessing. Well, it is all guessing, but it's, but at least it gives you, if you're, particularly if you're doing a comparison to historical performance of the team, then when you ha do have a situation, because inevitably you always do, um, whereby a feature ends up being way more complex than you thought it was going to be, and you come back and say, oh crap, you know, we thought it was going to be 20 points, and now we're total for this feature, and now we're looking at you know 50 points total for that feature. Um, what does that mean for the timeline? And so, and what does that mean in terms of how we want to deal with that in terms of what parts of that feature end up getting shipped with that release versus get punted to um, the next release cycle? So, mm -hmm. those, I mean, it helps to be able to. You, 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 even though it's monopoly money, you still have money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're still able to like have yeah. something that's relatively tangible, um, and be able to have those kind of conversations still. And you do run the risk that folks who are in, you know, the stereotypical bean counter type of role, mm -hmm. um, are going to perhaps put a little bit too much value on those points mm -hmm. and, and treat them a little bit more literally than they should. Mm -hmm. um, however, it does still nonetheless give you some kind of negotiation power um, because then you're able to educate up and manage up in terms of um, 
expectations and and what you know might need to uh, be addressed as a result of change that you didn't foresee. Yeah, so it sounds um, all true. I think you know I'm a I'm I'm a bit cynical when it comes to how you negotiate these things. Um, to me, the audience is almost everything. So like, am I talking to somebody that's seen a $30 million plus project fail before on their watch? Mm -hmm. Then I'd like you approach them a certain way. And they're like, okay, they know that two year long projects fail often. I don't have to say, trust me, they fail. Right. And you need to come to the, so it's like, okay, you should try to obey these points, this velocity and all that. If you're dealing with somebody, which a lot of times now people haven't seen, something like that you're dealing with somebody who hasn't but they're in charge of something that's going to be um you know could they think that it should be all planned out um a year long or whatever they don't care about you know points they care about hours and they care about resources and all that and you're trying to sell them it just depends on the the audience for me right um, but still yeah. in that particular case somebody from your your organization is talking to, to this customer and is having to translate for them Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, nobody's just gonna open up the, yeah. the, the and and it's a to me it's a good thing that they don't like someone just says just go ahead I'll come back to you in six oh. months and here's a hundred thousand dollars a month um and I'm just gonna punish you in six months if it's not done it it oftentimes it doesn't get done you know Which is where my question about the whole brainstorming thing you know, is is the agile cycle um. Uh, if I go to the small a agile, not the like scrum stuff mm -hmm. is about trying something and then getting feedback, mm -hmm. trying something again, getting feedback. And it's just, I didn't know with y'all's experience, what y'all were, were looking for in those cases of, because the whole thing of here's a check, come back to me when it's done thing. That that's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for, anyways, that's all I was just asking about. Okay. It's an interesting discussion. Does anyone else have anything? I know some people have some strong opinions on this stuff, but they're keeping quiet. Okay, because we're almost, we've kind of ate up the time, but I think it's a good conversation because we've got the video. We don't really have to worry about um, not getting through everything because, you know, to me, you can get through everything with the video. Um, some things we already talked about some of the highlights i think um trying to force design in is a thing that we i think is a thing that's left out of the process um and then we try to force it in um we do a lot of uh collaboration um a good book um i forget the name of the book right now lucina do you if you do you remember the name of the book with the time thieves I forget, but it's a, um, that's a good book. Um, I forget where we get that from implementation, testing, deployment. We do some things differently than, than some. Um, but we're, we're trying, we, as far as we're talking about software, you can try to do continuous delivery. Um, um but w personally, what I found is for the whole process, it's like 70% human problems and solving human problems and not tech problems um that's kind of the point so i think we probably got like five more minutes if anyone else has some comments does anyone just think that agile is just silly making work visible that's the name of the book with the time thieves I think that's a good book. It was recommended by Lucina. I think it was a good. We have a um, a video on that um, that you can watch. Anyone else have any comments? One of the um, questions, I guess, discussion was about um, where we use the process, and we've. I, I think we end up using. Um, we try to always have it internal, even if it's not accepted. So like the, what Watson was saying as far as design, if it's not being accepted by the stakeholders, 
and we try to do our best to gather whatever information and come back and do some of it. And then if as much as possible, we want everyone involved, you know, whoever we're working with. That can be dev teams where we may be supplementing. We, d we don't always do everything. So the, the work that we're doing, we often collaborate with other groups or maybe a company or in the open source stuff that we do, there will sometimes be multiple groups. So we try to get as many people in, involved and then we end up, um, there will be some portions internal that we end up supplementing and trying to follow. Um, and I, I think we've definitely seen the the stuff you're talking about with points being the internal external. There's one um, thing that I want to comment on with the, when people are leaving or coming, that's, we grow in size for projects quite a bit. Um, it changes in size, I should say. And we've found over the years that it's been better to always try to get people involved even if they're brand new and we just keep moving forward and it ends up, um, I guess, smoothing out. So, and that may be on that project or by the next project or whatever we're working on, it's the, the points and I'm talking internal, not the external side, which y'all covered pretty uh, strongly, but the internal side is more of like, having an idea of the amount of work. And I think that effort and risk, I think is probably the biggest deal. Getting people, at least in our experience, getting people to really think about risk and not talking about best possible chance or sandbagging, but being able to be honest about, here's what we're thinking. And then it goes from, you know, let's say it's a three pointer and all of a sudden it jumps to a 13 one something's really exposed about, we really don't know this, it's unknown. And and then being able to compare that. So someone that's saying, I don't have any experience with this and being able to talk in a group and say, well, I know you've worked on this and this and here's how those are similar. And then have everyone go through and do the points, they put something out and just keep doing that. And before you know it, they'll they actually go, oh, yeah, this is like this and it starts happening. But that's, I think, tied in with getting, especially for us in a cooperative, um, which is similar to open source projects, we really have to have people have full buy-in on a decision to make sure that it moves forward. And the do, doing the points and stuff is part of that and understanding and kind of comparing it so that people are more aware of what other people's jobs are. So you may not be doing that work, but you know that they're doing it and they have more appreciation and stuff. So more buy-in for the overall end results. Well, I would definitely see it in a co-op that makes a little more sense of people being willing to um, speak up and and ask more questions and kind of come to their own decision on it. I've uh, in my experience, I've definitely seen different agile groups do different things. But um, uh, one of the most corrupting factors is when management tries to game the system or tries to mm -hmm. uh, uh, orchestrate a, a certain outcome. And it's like if they just say what their their goals are and what their targets are, and then let us um, amongst ourselves talk through these things without you know kind of an like I said, in an open forum, over time you gain trust with each other, and some of the fear gets off uh, offloaded at that point. So there, there's, I can definitely see if you're. That's why I'm saying how often do y'all switch the teams, <clears throat> or at least the different organization, because um, the more often you work with people, then the more often you understand how how they work and how they approach problems, and uh, the, the point system makes a lot more sense. In, in those scenarios, in particular, if you're not directly exposing them out to customers. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for, for us, I guess we, we do go between a lot of different projects and um, companies. So there's, 
We get a little bit of both sides where you get to know some of the people, especially if they're going, you keep running into this um, similar folks in the industry. Um, and we have a pretty large group of like freelance and contractors and stuff that we call associates that we work with. And that helps. We also have very much the other side where it's new and you're coming in and um, you may not even that you may not have enough comfort from them or whatever for them to communicate timelines or total budget or any number of details. And we have to deal with, we've had to deal with a lot of change on that side. So figuring out like, how do we, I don't want to say cut corners, but figuring out where we can focus on getting people comfortable as soon as possible whenever we're getting around new people is really important. Um, and I think that's really increased for us in some of the open source world um, where we're working with essentially lots of companies and then a mix of, of groups of people from different companies. So being able to get in and, and try to find some way to get people to collaborate, which seems more and more to be what's the smallest set of things that the group can find some value in and not worry about trying to cover all of it externally. Like internally for us, we may say, we need to do all of these features and goals or whatever, and we need to cover these things. But externally, as far as like asking for help and trying to get that collaboration on brainstorming or um, whatever we're trying to do, um, shrinking the number of options or number of focus that are potentially going to be value and putting that out seems to be helpful for us, um, which seems to me to fit with anything when you have a new group, like before you've built that. Um, I guess relationship where you might be able to put more on the table at once. So it takes more effort, I guess, up front. Um, but there's a little bit more, there's more work for us. And that kind of ties in maybe into some of the other things uh, you'd mentioned that Watson was saying is in other talks, like as far as the consulting and working with other groups. So as a cooperative and we, the ones in the group that are like especially owners or we're trying to get people mentoring to lead in groups, then there's, you end up with wearing a lot of hats and doing a lot of additional things to get to a point to where you can work through these process on a project. Well, with that, I think we're we're running uh, over time here, so I was gonna go ahead and uh, stop the the recording, and then um, if, if anyone else has any other comments, uh, let me know. I was gonna stop recording and then talk about what's gonna happen next or next week, next month. Sounds good. Cool.